Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this session on transfer pricing for financial transactions at the ACT's Festival of Treasury Transformation. During today's session, we will focus on how treasury transformation can support your transfer pricing compliance and streamline your intercompany finance processes. So more specifically, the pricing of intercompany loans, financial guarantees, and the determination of internal cash pool and in our bank interest rates. Before we deep dive into the uh, content, please be aware that you can ask questions via the Q&A on top of the screen. And it's also there that you can answer our polling questions. My name is Kasmir Lurigdan, and today I'm joined by my co colleague, Melanie Beyes. And we are part of the Transfer Pricing for Treasury team at Sanders. For those who are not familiar with Sanders, we are an advisory firm in the area of treasury risk and finance with offices in the UK, Netherlands, Belgium, Switzerland, Sweden, Japan, and the US. We are part of the internal innovation team that builds a uh, cloud-based platform with innovative treasury and risk solutions uh, for the corporate treasury market. And for, we are responsible for the transfer pricing solution, which is an end-to-end -end, uh, solution that creates uh, an arm's length pricing study for intercompany loans and cash pools. That being said, uh, the agenda for today looks like the following. First, we would like to give you some more background on transfer pricing and why it is important for corporate treasurers. Secondly, we will focus on the arm's length pricing of intercompany loans and financial guarantees, and so standalone financial transactions within the group. Thirdly, we will switch towards pool types of transaction, yeah, so the determination of internal in-house bank interest rates and cash pool rates, as there is a much more complexity in this process compared to intercompany loans. And then lastly, we'll give you the key takeaways for today and also suggest the Xander's approach based on client cases. So first of all, what is transfer pricing and why is it, is it important for treasury? And transfer pricing is the art of determining an arm's length price or a market conform price for all intercompany transactions. When we zoom into treasury, you see that transfer pricing complexity arises from four different types of transactions, either long-term funding via intercompany loans within the group or the uh, provision of a financial guarantee from the group towards a finance company, for example, and on the other hand, also short-term cash concentration, either at the bank via cash pools or via an in-house bank or in-house cash uh, application. In, the, in this presentation, we will first focus on standalone uh, facilities, yeah, so long-term intercompany loans and financial guarantees. And then in the third chapter of this presentation, we'll shift towards the pooled types of transaction, yeah, so the determination of cash pool interest rates and in-house bank interest rates. First of all, why is this relevant for Treasury? We have actually observed much more scrutiny from uh, tax authorities over the last years. And as you can see on the next slide, that's not very surprising since there's a lot of change in the regulatory landscape over the last few years. Yeah. So if you look at transfer pricing, then you see that the OECD published their new transfer pricing guidelines already in 2017, which were an update. And these are general transfer pricing guidelines, meaning that they form the foundation of the analysis that we will show you today. It gives you the methods to be used and the different principles uh, to take into account. But it's very difficult uh, to use those for financial transactions without additional guidelines. That's why in 2018, they published a non-consensus uh, discussion draft on financial transactions. And also here, they limit the scope mostly to intercompany loans, financial guarantees, and cash pools. Now, this year in February, it was the first ever consensus document on transfer pricing for financial transactions specifically. And you see that it's actually taking a lot of the best practices for intercompany loans and uh, financial guarantees into that document, while there are more gray areas for cash pooling and in house bank interest rates. That's why we decided to first focus on the best practice methodology for intercompany loans and then add a layer of complexity for these pool types of uh, transactions. But in general, you already feel there's much more complexity to the process 
And as such, we would try to keep this presentation as practical as possible so that you can identify tips and tricks to streamline your internal processes and even to automate your internal processes. Before we go into the content, let's see what the Treasury response on this document has been so far. Uh, recently, we've, we've done a similar webinar. We've asked our, the Treasury uh, participants a few polling questions, as we will do today. And here are, are already the results. You saw that at the time, already half of the uh, corporate treasurers were rethinking their transfer pricing approach towards financial transactions as a response to this 2020 document. And even more, yeah, about two thirds, were also indicating that they would like to improve their transfer pricing documentation, which is why we will focus on this uh, presentation, not only on the practical and procedural part, but also on how to document uh, your transfer pricing study or pricing. We see that 82% uses already technology for transfer pricing. Huh? It's actually quite complex and can be uh, a burden. So in order to reduce this compliant burden, we see different levels of technology being used. Huh? That can range from Excel towards uh, the use of market data providers of credit rating agencies towards an end-to-end -end solution at the other side of the spectrum uh, as uh, is available, for example, on a, on our cloud-based platform. Lastly, we see that almost everyone indicated that they rely on outsourcing for transfer pricing studies. Um, but here it's good to distinguish between the bulk of the transactions and high value transactions. And we see a lot of automation and technology being used for the bulk transactions. So let's say the standardized loans, which are rolled over each year or initiated on a frequent basis. And then we see a more manual um, approach being taken for high value loans um, that occur maybe just once a year. So hopefully this already gives you an idea of how Treasury has reacted on the 2020 document from the OECD uh, so far. And let this be an introduction to Melanie, who will now show you the approach towards intercompany loans and financial guarantees in more detail. Thank you, Kathleen. Um, before going into more detail about the term loans and the guarantees, first want to give you an overview of what we would like you to take away from, um, from this um, part of the session. Um, so what we will try to do first is to give you kind of a recap of that document, um, of that 2020 document of the OECD, um, and let you know what the key takeaways of those were and um, which might be the biggest impact for you. A second element is uh, what we will discuss is how you can create a compliant credit rating model and um, also give you some examples on that and um, the alliance with the OECD um, transfer pricing guidelines. The third element is then to how to actually substantiate your interest rate for your term loans and um, also for your guarantees, uh, which of course takes into account that credit rating model, but also other terms and conditions. And we will of course also throughout um, this section try to kind of give you some guidance on what can be um, on how automation um, can help you do this credit rating and pricing process in order to relieve um, the compliant, compliance burden to some extent um, for the treasury department and the tax department as well of course so first um, let's give some let's go into some more detail about um, the OECD guidance and what came out of that document um, that of course already had a discussion draft in 2018, but then the final um, document was uh, published in February. Uh, the final document on term loans and guarantees actually didn't really um, have a lot of, of, of um, shocking differences compared to the discussion draft. Um, but so there are four main elements that we can take away from that. And the first one is the accurate delineation. Um, so what we want to say with accurate delineation is that um, the OECD really stresses that you shouldn't only look at the, contra the contract um, of an intercompany transaction, but also look at what the actual um, economic circumstances are. Um, an example for that, for, of that, for instance, is um, you see a lot of corporates which have 
one uh, year loans that are just continuously being rolled forward. And tax authorities could look at those and say, well, actually, that, that's not a one year loan. Um, you knew beforehand already that it would be rolled forward. It's been like that for years and years. So actually, that's maybe a five year loan, which consequently has a higher interest rate, or they can, could even requalify that as, um, as equity. So on the one hand, it's that. On the other hand, um, what they also uh, stress is that you should um, look at this um, taking a two-sided approach. And uh, what we want to say with that is you need to look at it from a borrower and a lender's perspective, um, as if they were being third parties and not related. Um, so this is kind of the question of would a loan be granted versus would a loan be requested even in that form? Um, so an example of that, for instance, is where you um, give your subsidiary a five-year loan and it's a bullet loan, uh, but actually the subsidiary really has enough cash to um, make linear repayments. And in that case, the tax authorities could say, well, a normal third party or an unrelated party, they would have chosen that linear loan because you would have a lower interest rate. So for them, it's it's actually better um, and cheaper. Um, so this is, for instance, also something that always takes need to be taken into account, that two-sided approach. From a lender's perspective, this is um, for a big part um, comprised already in the credit rating analysis and in the resulting credit risk premium, of course. Um, so the second element that the OECD um, is quite clear on are credit ratings. Um, and so they do stress that they need to be subsidiary specific. So a credit rating needs to be determined for each and every um, subsidiary. Um, what they also, for instance, state is that they don't, well, they have a preference for not using black, black box software. Um, and what they mean with that is you, there are quite some tools in the market whereby you just uh, fill in a couple of balance sheets and uh, P&L items. And basically the result is a credit rating and you don't really know where it's coming from. Um, so there it's really important to um, use a transparent methodology so you can kind of track why a certain rating is being given to a certain um, subsidiary. In addition to that, they also stress the importance of taking into account um, group support. Um, so this group support, um, and that's a mainly implicit group support, what this actually wants to say is, well, if you were a third party bank and you're looking at a subsidiary, um, you will look at it, of course, as a standalone entity because it's not the same rating as if you were granting a loan to really the, the head office um, of the group. But you will take into account that to some extent, the um, group might help out that entity if it were ever in, pro uh, in trouble and not able to um, repay its debts. And we will go into more detail um, on that analysis in the next slides so, as well, of course. Then the third element is the cup method. So this is really on the pricing part, so on the interest rate part of um, your analysis. So the cut method is the comparable uncontrolled pricing method. Um, and what that actually means is, um, well, or examples of that, uh, you have an internal and an external cup. An internal cup, um, for instance, is where you have a transaction that's comparable to the transaction you're trying to price within the group, but with an external party. So an example of that is um, the bank uh, providing a loan Towards, your, towards the group um, and all of the terms and conditions of that loan are the same, then you have an internal cup. An external cup is the same, but then it's between two unrelated parties. So for instance, a bank granting a loan to um, another group. Um, what they, so what they do state, the OECD guidelines, is that the cup method is the preferred method. Um, and the cost of funds method is basically fully discredited. Um, especially when it's in the form of taking really the average cost of funds of the group and using that on all your intercompany transactions, that's no longer allowed. The cost of funds approach is still allowed in the case of, as I was just explaining, an internal cup. So for instance, if you have an external loan and you're um, 
So, and it's to your financing entity, but you're redistributing that immediately towards um, another entity within the group. Um, and that entity has the same rating and is the same terms and conditions. In that case, you're still allowed to use the cost of funds, but specifically of that transaction then as well. Another element here is bank quotes. Um, and those, they really um, state explicitly that they're no um, longer allowed to be used. And the reasoning there is that it's not an actual transaction that has taken place and you need to base your pricing on actual transactions. The last element here is um, the financial guarantees. So these are really explicit guarantees that are being provided and so it's a binding contract that um, the head office provides to a subsidiary. And in this case, they do state that a guarantee fee um, is always due. Whereas with the implicit group support that I was explaining earlier for the credit ratings, um, they actually explicitly say that no um, fee is due for that. But for this, it is. And they also put forward um, five methods, of which one is the yield method, and which is actually um, most um, easy to, to use, and which is also therefore most widely used. And I'll go into more detail on the methods um, in the next slides. So then, um, based on that OECD guidance, um, what is really a logical four-step approach to be used to start um, calculating your standalone rates? And so the first um, step you should always take is the credit rating assessment. So this is really on um, subsidiary level for the, um, for the borrowing entity. The second element that needs to be taken into account are the terms and conditions of the transaction. The third element then is kind of really coming forward from the first and second step. A combination of that allows you to, to make your pricing assessment. And then finally, of course, um, the transfer pricing documentation is very important and should be um, expensive and reflecting all of the elements of the first three steps. So going into a bit more detail on the credit rating assessment. So here, they're very clear on the fact that it needs to be quantitative and qualitative. So what they mean here is just a ratio analysis on balance sheet and PNL items is not sufficient. So also some qualitative elements should always be taken into account in order to determine um, your credit rating. Another element that should be taken into account are, are things such as country risk, industry risk, and business risk. Um, whereby business risk, for instance, reflects more the purpose of the loan you are putting in place. For instance, is it an M&A loan, which might make it more risky, um, and so on. Then the last element um, is that implicit or explicit group support um, that I was talking about earlier. So the ways to determine this level of support. So basically, when there's explicit support, you just, of course, equal the rating of the subsidiary to that of the group. Um, but do take into account that you will also need to pay um, a, a guarantee fee for that. So uh, it's not as easy as just saying the, the rating is, is the same. Uh, and we can price like that. You would then also need to, of course, charge a guarantee fee. The other element is implicit support. And the way to determine that is kind of so you're, you're trying to determine what the likelihood would be that um, the group would help out that entity if it was ever in trouble. And there's, um, so this is of course a bit more um, flu because the, the OCD is not very explicit about how to determine that. So it's really um, up to the, uh, the taxpayer to kind of defend why they have, um, allocated a certain level um, of implicit support, but a good way to substantiate it is by, for instance, saying, okay, the entity, um, the subsidiary has the same name as the, um, as the parent, because that, of course, you know, if that were ever to fail, then it has a negative effect on the name of the group. Um, another element is how much of the um, subsidiary, of the shares of the subsidiary are owned by the group. Um, which is something to take into account. Another element that can, for instance, be taken into account is historical group support. So has the, the group been known to do that um, before to help out entities? 
And what you will typically see is that for entities that are very um, important to the group, such, such as, for instance, the financing company, or it can also be um, an important R&D facility, that those will end up with a kind of higher amount of implicit support and therefore also their rating will be more affected by that level of implicit support. While on the other spectrum, you could have, for instance, a sale entity, a sales entity in a, in a country that has a lot less implicit support. Um, and so the adjustment to the standalone rating should be less for that entity uh, because you could say, okay, if that entity is really struggling for years and years, um, the group would actually maybe let it fail at some point. Um, so the level of group support is a bit less high. The second element um, of the uh, analysis are the terms and conditions. Um, so what I was also already explaining earlier, so here it's also important to take into account that accurate delineation of the transaction, right? Um, so the need to determine per new loan okay, which term are we going to use here? Which type of structure are we going to use here, right? Especially for the repayment schedule, are we using linear bullet? So what you typically see a lot of groups doing is say, okay, for long-term loans, we basically always just use a five-year bullet loan. So those kinds of approaches are really not um, completely compliant anymore. And you would need to look more on a transaction per transaction basis. The currency of the transaction is also very important, of course. Um, the structure, if there's any kind of subordination. And um, there it's also important to note. So it's one thing to say, okay, this loan is subordinated, but there of course needs to be something to subordinate it to. Um, so just using those types of structures to inflate your interest rate, of course, also can cause more and more scrutiny, especially if there's no actual, um, the, well, if the economic circumstances don't actually allow that type of structure. So once those two elements um, are fully determined, you're actually, um, you're, you're able to um, go into your pricing assessment. And this of course is built up out of different components and we'll also go into more detail um, of that later. Uh, but I think for um, tax purposes, the most important uh, component is, of course, that credit risk margin. Um, and because that's really unique to your entity and transaction. Uh, and here, what you see mostly in the market is that the um, OASs or yield to maturities of um, traded bonds are being used just because loan data itself is not very widely available and there's too many, uh, too little comparables to use. Um, and then as also stated already before, so internal comparables should only be used when really all terms and conditions are the same. And also when of course the, um, the internal comparable is entered into around the same time as, um, as your internal loan. It's, it's, for instance, a bit more difficult to defend using um, a loan that you entered into externally a half a year ago and then using that to set your prices um, right this moment as well, especially, for instance, considering the current circumstances as really the credit mar risk margins have shifted quite a bit. Then the last um, element is financial guarantees. So what the yield approach actually does uh, with financial guarantees, it um, takes the same approach to determine um, a credit risk margin as for loans, but it determines, determines it twice. So once without an explicit guarantee and once with an explicit guarantee. So you have to calculate basically the borrowing costs with guarantee and without guarantee. And the difference between those, difference between those is the maximum guarantee fee that you can charge. What the OCD doesn't state is, well, which percentage should you then actually charge? It's just a maximum. Um, what they do make clear is that both parties need to be better off. So both the entity receiving the guarantee and the entity giving the guarantee should be better off. So it's somewhere, I guess, between 99% and 1%, but they don't, you still need to determine it then exactly. But in general, it's the more, most straightforward um, way to calculate the financial guarantees. Finally then, um, your transfer pricing documentation. 
So it makes most sense to first start out having a transfer pricing policy, which details really your methodology that you use for your financial transactions. This is also something that can be used, for instance, in master file and local file uh, reporting. And it also enables you, once you have a good transfer pricing policy in place, your time spent per transaction will really decrease. Um, the second element is, of course, also your transfer pricing reports need to be created then also per transaction. And this, of course, needs to be needs to include um, which interest rates you use, how you got to those rates, so the comparability analysis you made, and of course, also the determination of your credit rating. Um, so to then go a bit more into detail on the pricing assessment, so how to really do that in practice. So what we see is that it's a buildup basically of four components, the arm's length price. The first component is the reference rate, uh, whereby you usually see that for um, shorter term loans, you use respective IBORs uh, as a reference rate. For longer term loans, it's in the IRSs, just because the IBORs aren't available anymore. The second element, that element that um, is most important um, for, for tax purposes is the credit risk premium. And this is really where a loan pricing model is in place. And in the next slide, I will also go into detail on how that loan pricing model works um, at Zenders. Uh, and here, so here you take into account your credit rating assessment, your facility types and your securitization. And of course also, where you make comparability adjustments um, to the comparables you've selected. A third element then is a sovereign risk premium. Uh, what you see being used a lot here is the CADS spreads um, of the countries. Um, and this is really to uh, reflect a funding risk um, in the country of the borrower. A fourth element, um, which is really kind of an optionality, some um, corporates like to use it, other do, don't, is a liquidity risk premium. And why you would use that or add that is because um, your loan pricing model, so where you base your credit risk premium on, is usually um, based on um, bond data, traded bond data. And those are, of course, a lot more liquid than loans. So that's why um, it's sometimes appropriate to also add a liquidity risk premium. So for the pricing assessment, just to go a bit more in a practical approach, how we then do that um, at Zenders. So what we do is we look actually on the, at the traded bonds universe and we map um, the traded bonds that we can find um, to a risk profile. And this risk profile is based on the credit risk of the issuers, but also on the term, um, the, the loss given default and so on. So the level of securitization and so on. And we map that risk profile, as you can see here on the x-axis. And on the y-axis, we uh, map the credit risk premium. What we then do in a second step is we determine the risk profile of the tested transaction. And um, we map that on the best fitting regression uh, of that uh, bond data. And this is how we determine um, a credit risk premium for really a very specific tested transaction. Uh, for transfer pricing purposes, of course, also important to have an interquartile range and to really also give details on your most comparable transactions. So what we then also do is we look at the most comparable transactions around that point um, of the tested transaction. And for those, we also give the details, but most importantly, what we also do is we make comparability adjustments for each and every one of these transactions. So as you can see here in the screen, um, uh, for instance, on this example, you have a, a, a rating and your comparable transaction is one notch up. And so for that notch up, where we make comparability adjustments of a certain amount of basis points. And the same, for instance, also happens um, for, the, for a, a difference in maturity. Um, and of course, it can also happen if there's differences in currencies and so on, but that's not um, yeah, in this example right now. And so this type of data is everything that you really do need to put in your transfer pricing report. And you need to be 
really look at um, transaction level debt details and make your comparability adjustment and add those to your transfer pricing reports per transactions. So again, if you have any questions on this um, uh, present uh, this part, please um, send ask them via the Q and A section, um, and then Casimir will tell you a bit more on cash flows. Thank you, Melanie, for the presentation. And I think it's uh, as a summary, it's good to remember that pricing of intercompany loans is a four-step approach with. Uh, the, the borrower specific credit rating and the terms and conditions as inputs towards the pricing assessment. Um, and then making sure that you document that pricing assessment on a transactional level as well. Uh, as a recap, we have created a um, polling question on this and then more specifically on the credit rating part. Yeah, so as Melanie explained, it's common practice now to shift towards uh, entity specific credit rating. And uh, we invite our audience to answer the uh, question on top of the screen so we can see the polling results coming in. Uh, the first two possible answers are that you use the group rating um, for all intercompany loans. The second one is a bit more sophisticated already and using uh, buckets of credit ratings whereby you um, address certain or link certain entities to certain buckets. And so for example, one credit rating per business line and then the, the last two um, possible answers are the one that the OECD are stating, a yeah, standalone or subsidiary specific credit rating with or without uh, group support. And actually here we see uh, different, two different approaches, uh, either as we at Sanders do it and, and calculate the first the standalone rating of the borrowing entity and then notch upwards towards the rating of the parent depending on the level of group support. Or what you sometimes also see is that you start from the group rating and then notch downwards um, depending on this group support again. And so we see there different uh, approaches being taken. And actually to give you some background on those two approaches in the draft OECD document, we saw that there um, was a preference for the notching up principle, um, but that preference is were deleted in the final consensus document. So really both approaches are allowed. Um, meanwhile, we see the results coming in. Um, assuming that everyone has answered, I'll update the results uh, one more time. And actually we see, uh, actually also in line with what we see from clients, uh, up till now, a lot of companies are using the group rating or buckets of entities and assigning a rating to it. And already a third of uh, the, the people that are answering the polling question have shifted towards an entity specific uh, credit rating. If we continue the presentation and then we'll shift our focus towards pool types of transactions. Yeah? And here we have four uh, key learning objectives as well um, that you will see on the next slide. So here, first we would like to link the best practices in cash management towards the OECD's uh, guidance and that can be quite uh, tricky sometimes as we will sp speak in our presentation a lot about the pricing of a cash pool or an in-house bank you will see in a cash management setup very often there are multiple cash pools or uh, an in-house bank that interact with each other mm -hmm. so it's good to look at the OECD guidance but also apply a holistic view on the entire cash management setup and we'll sometimes make a small deviation in order to see how um, different cash pools interact with each other and what the effect on the pricing is. Yeah, Se second one is obviously the determination of internal cash pool interest rates. And you will see that we follow basically a two-step approach here. First, calculating the benefit from having a cash pool and then allocating this benefit towards the participants as well as the leader relative to their contribution to the cash pool. The pricing of the determination of in-house bank interest rate that follows the same methodology. But we'll see that we'll typically um, allocate a larger part of the cash pool benefit or in-house bank benefit towards the, the treasury or the top entity. And then lastly, when explaining the um, compliance 
areas, we will also like to give you a step-by-step -step guide in order to identify an internal process for you um, that you can that you can use in order to achieve this compliance. Now again, we will try to present you the OECD guidance and give you a practical angle for you to work with uh, in a period to come. If you go to the next slide, then you can see the four key takeaways from the OECD. First is the functional analysis that you should make for each cash pool. Again, here, applying the holistic view across the different cash pools. And the functional analysis basically means that you document uh, which entities are contributing the most to the cash pool in terms of their balances, for example, but also in who is taking the risks or performing any functions. And it can be that there's not a lot of functions performed um, by the multinational or the corporate itself and done by the bank. Otherwise, we see also for in-house bank that a lot, for example, the treasury entities is doing the functions and also setting the financial risk policies. So those are different situations and it's good to document that because we will need this in the second step that you see here. That is the synergy or benefit calculation and allocation. And we'll go into this more quantitative part in a few moments. And basically means comparing the situation with the pooling structure and without the pooling structure. The difference between that is the benefit from having the pooling structure. And this will need to be allocated to those participants that contribute the most to the pool. And so it's really the next step when you have created the functional analysis, which will dictate to which entities most of the benefit should go. Apart from that, we see two other key takeaways. First being structural balances in the pool. Uh, we see some differences some, uh, between countries, but as a general rule of thumb, you can assume that if, a if an entity has a position which is structurally positive or negative for longer than a year in the same pool, that you can see it as a structural balance. And in fact, it should be converted into an intercompany loan with the interest rate that Melanie just explained, uh, because it actually has the risk of being reclassified otherwise by the tax authorities into an intercompany loan. So really making sure that this cash flow structure is still being used as a liquidity instrument rather than giving or handing out hidden loans. Lastly, um, documentation is also quite important, very much like Melanie said. Eh? Each time that you determine your interest rates within a cash flow in a bank, it's good to document this analysis. Eh? So document basically the three previous pillars on this slide, and eh? you document the functional analysis which entities are contributing to the pool, the calculation and allocation of the cash pool synergy, and then lastly, also substantiate that you've done the structural balances analysis. Before we go into the uh, calculation uh, mechanisms, it's maybe good to also define the scope of this document. And if you go to the next slide, then you can see that it is being used for different types of cash pool. It's not the, the scope of today's presentation to, um, to explain the different types of cash pooling, but for those participating in this session, it's good to know that this can be applied to notional cash pools, physical cash pools, and in-house banks. It's the same process, but you'll see that the functional analysis is, is, a, is different between the contractual types of pooling structures, and it will also drive the interest rate uh, setting within the pool. But all three types are in scope of, of this presentation. So what are we uh, addressing here from a regulatory point of view? In the next slide, you can see how you can quantify the calculation of uh, the cash pool benefit. And it's basically the difference from having a cash pool and not having it. So what you see here on the slide on the left is a situation, quite a simplified situation of a corporate with no pooling structure. So you have entity A and entity B, one with a negative balance, one with a positive balance. And the one with a negative balance is paying 1.5% towards the bank. And the ones with a positive balance is uh, receiving 1% from the bank, which from a overview or high level point of view results in an interest expense of 0.3 in this situation. On the right side, you see the simplified cash pooling situation, whereby you have the cash pool leader as an intermediary level, whereby you offset debit and credit balances which end up in this simplified example of a positive balance of 20, and you have 1% with the bank. So here you have an interest income of 0.2. So the pooling synergy or the pooling benefit 
it's actually 0 0.5 here, yeah, which is a difference from the interest expense of 0 0.3 and the interest income of 0 0.2. And so this is what we are talking about when we define cash pooling synergy or benefit. Yeah, obviously this is a simplified example. So when calculating this, it can become trickier. For example, if they're multi-currency or just much more entities and much more balances. What is the core of the, um, the purpose of the OECD in this sense is that not all profit that comes from this cash pool synergy will reside with the cash pool leader. It needs to be allocated to the cash pool leader, but the participants as well, relative to their contribution in the pool, so that not all synergy will stick per se with the cash pool leader and as such will be taxed in their country. As a result, you will see that there's a difference between standalone rates that Melanie has explained for uh, intercompany loans, for example, and the interest rate, rate within an in-house bank or cash pool. Okay. The part of the cash pool um, synergy that needs to be allocated will be a discount for pooled withdrawal rates or a premium for pooled deposit rates. And so your starting point will again be that standalone rate that Melanie explained, but then for a shorter maturity, obviously. Um, and then this analysis will actually be in order to either determine the, the pooling discount or premium per entity participating in the pool. Um, before we um, continue, we have a polling question, which you can again uh, answer on top of the screen. And the question is, how do you determine your cash pool interest rates at the moment? Uh, from our experience, we see basically three different categories on how to do that. We either have, um, we have corporates that use the external interest rate that the cash pool leader has with the bank also internally. The indirect consequence of that is that you will actually allocate all netting um, benefits or, or yeah, cash pool synergy to the cash pool leader. Some already adjust for that and apply a fixed margin. And we see first corporates also being moving towards an exact calculation of this cash pool synergy and allocation. So I invite you to um, answer those via the polling questions while we refresh our results. Yeah, so the first um, results are coming in. We give the audience, uh, let's say maybe 30 more seconds to, uh, to respond. I, see, I still see the, um, the previous polling question. So I guess we will come back to uh, this polling question since we can't see the results for now. Okay. So that will be uh, fixed. Um, if we then move with the presentation towards the next slide, we will start with the more procedural uh, part that a corporate can follow in order to determine these cash pool benefits allocation into pooling discounts and premiums as shown on the previous slide. We will do so starting from cash pool data that you require towards compliance, overdraft, and deposit rates per participate in the pool. Um, what is the data that you need? First of all, you need the financial data of each cash pooling participant in order to create the credit rating per participant. And this is following the same methodology as Melanie explained in the second chapter of this presentation. Now, an important side note is that there are very often cross guarantees within the pool. If those are apparent, it's actually best practice to determine one credit rating for the entire um, for the entire pool, and then to work continuing with that. Yeah. That's what we call credit rating equalization. Second uh, part of data from your cash pool that you need are the cash pool balances, very often by day. Um, of the last period. And so we see corporates repricing their in interest rates on a quarterly or yearly basis. And so each time that you do that, you need the cash flow balance for the last period in order to set the interest rates 
for the next period. And then lastly, you also need general information on the cash pool in order to create this functional analysis um, of the pool. Yeah. But that's more qualitative information. There where the first two types of cash pool data is uh, quantitative. What are then the different steps to move towards this compliant overdraft and deposit rate per participant? First, you need to calculate the synergy yeah? as shown on the screen a few, few slides back. You, there are two types of um, synergies, the netting synergy purely from offsetting debit and credit balances. And there is an interest rate synergy as you might get a better rate at the bank because you pull your cash towards one bank. And that's what we call the total synergy. Second step is then to allocate that towards the cash pool leader, depending on the functional analysis of the cash pool leader. And here, the differences between the different types of cash pools kick in. And if you have a notional pool, and it's very likely that your pool header will be a service provider, since a lot of um, the functions are actually already performed by the bank. And it's the opposite way around for in-house bank structures, for example. Then we see a percentage is allocated towards the cash pool leader, and then the remainder is going to the different cash pool participants. And this is actually a gray area from a regulatory point of view. Yeah. You see that it should be relative to the contribution of the pool, but that can be quantified in different ways. Yeah. You can do it relative to their position or their balance in the pool or to their uh, credit rating, for example, or if that's all the same, equally for all participants. So here it's good to also make a study of the contribution by balance and by credit rating of each entity towards the pool. And once that is determined, those allocated benefits should be priced into the interest rate, resulting in an overdraft rate and a deposit rate per participant for the next period. And it's good, again, to document the specifics of the analysis, as well as the uh, transfer pricing report with the methodology that, you, uh, that you've used. Um, Melanie, could we see the, uh, the polling results? Um, I don't think we have already have the results. I think the uh, question one was still up. So, but now question two should, should be up. So uh, you will be able to answer that question um, if you go to the live polling again. Um, and again, it was on the um, how you are currently setting the interest rates for your cash flows or in house banks. Um, and we have three possible answers. Of course, you might be somewhere in the middle or somewhere else, uh, but so for the ones that are um, in one of those three answers. And I think we'll see the, um, the answers coming in, in just a, a couple of seconds, of course, but we'll give you some time to answer that, of course. Yeah. Meanwhile, we see that the first person has answered the polling question using the external rates with the bank for the internal positions. Um, it's good to know that if you do so, all netting benefit actually indirectly is allocated towards the cash pool leader. So it might be good to review this and see uh, if some participants are actually taking a risk within the pool, and then they should get remunerated as well. That can either be done by applying a fixed margin to those rates, a fixed uh, pool premium and full discount and then you already shift uh, a part of that cash pool synergy towards the different participants and we actually see that some of the uh, participants are already doing that if we continue with the presentation then we have from a practical angle a few tips and tricks if you shift from this uh, process towards the exact quantification of the cash pool synergy and allocation of it if you go uh, to the next slide, yeah, here we see the uh, synergy calculation. You can either do that by time or in a numerical way per participant. And if you are able to design your process in such a way that you can switch be between the different views, then it actually will give you increased treasury insights as well. When determining the allocation key to uh, allocate the cash flow synergy towards the different participants, it's also good to have increased um, knowledge on the cash pool. Yeah? So if you see on the slide at the moment, you see a graph that gives the credit rating and balances uh, per participant in the pool. Uh, 
Um, and you see actually here on the top right that you have um, entities that contribute the most in credit rating and in balance. So it's logical to give those most of the remuneration um, and most of the cash flow benefit. Uh, it's also good to keep in mind the goal of your calculation yeah, so that in, in, if you uh, have a result that you need to know whether you need the, just the margins or the entire interest rate. Yeah, so when designing your process, keep in mind um, the, the outcome of it. And then lastly, the identification of structural balances. Uh, here it's good to um, to have a, a standard dashboard that will show you the structural balances um, over time per participant. So here it's good to keep track on a yearly basis of your uh, balances in the pool. And that you can have automatic reminders um, when they become structural. And so here, as an example, you see the different cash pool participants. Most of them are fine, but if you look at a year's time horizon, then you'll see some being structurally positive, structurally negative, and uh, cash flow participant F in this example is becoming structural. Yeah? So here it's quite easy to create a, a useful dashboard that automatically detects when a uh, position becomes structural. And so as a, as a summary for this chapter, please keep in mind to first calculate the cash pool synergy and then allocate towards the different participants and leader as well, depending on their contribution towards the cash pool. I see we have uh, about eight minutes left, so I'll hand over back to Melanie for the key takeaways of this session. Thank you. Yeah, and before we go into the key takeaways, we still have a last um, polling question, um, which so you can again answer um, if you go to the, um, the panel uh, above in the screen. And this is on, you know, considering you've just seen the presentation and all of the implications of the OCD and how you can apply it in, um, in practice. Um, so the question is, have you then aligned your transfer policy already with the newly published guidelines? Um, that would be, of course, pretty quick, but maybe you have a policy that is already quite in line with the uh, guidelines or you made some adjustments after uh, the discussion draft, which was already published two years ago. And most elements are, of course, quite in line with each other. So, um, so it might already be, um, be aligned with the, with the newly published guidelines. And we see now the answers coming in and okay, quite a number of people um, say they are in line actually already with the new guidelines. So that would be uh, pretty good. I'm a bit surprised considering the answers to the previous questions. Ah, okay, it's shifting now. <laughs> it's a bit more in line uh, with the answers of the previous questions. Um, but so Considering that, we'll go to the key takeaways that, um, from, the, from the presentation that we just gave. And so those are on three levels. So the first one is, of course, the OECD guidance itself and what it means. Second one, term loans and guarantees. And the final one is on cash flows. Um, so what we do see with this new OECD guidance on financial transactions, but also already um, because the master file and local file documentation and the also exchange of documentation between tax authorities internationally is that there's really an increased scrutiny from tax authorities and also on financial transactions. And especially with these doc this document, we, um, we expect that scrutiny only to increase also because tax authorities will be kind of better educated right now. It's kind of, it's a topic that they tend to stay away from um, a little bit because it's outside of their comfort zone. Um, but through this, through this document, they're of course better educated and it's also kind of a guidance on which they can base um, TP questionnaires and they can really um, ask all the right questions um, from the start and see what you will answer to them. And then of course, go into more detail on it. So taking that into account, there's really an a necessity for consistent and clear documentation um, to kind of limit also the burden on, on, on the treasury side and on the TP side. 
um, because do take in mind that these tax audits come three years later. And uh, if it's not all consistent and well documented, it can take a lot of time to reassemble how you came up with certain um, rates uh, three years later. So the second one then on term loans and guarantees. So what's important is to have an entity specific credit rating to take into account group analysis and to also make really an analysis of comparable transactions. Um, and the last one, of course, is also that a new remuneration is due if there's really a financial guarantee given. On cash pools, then, it's important to have an analysis of the functional profile of the cash pool. So determine um, the assets used, the risks uh, borne, and the uh, functions performed by the cash pool leader and um, therefore also determine what part of the synergies can be allocated to the cash flow leader. So for that part, it's also important to calculate those synergies or the benefits that are generated by running a cash flow or an in-house bank. And so to divide that to the leader and of course also to the participants based on that functional profile. The last element here is that possible requalification of structural balances um, into longer term loans or deposits. So really just an analysis you can make on a six month or a year basis. Um, so you can um, requalify structural balances into longer term um, loans or deposits. Okay, so I can, uh, I think a lot of you might be wondering how to do this then, right? Because it could uh, pose a very big compliance burden on the Treasury Department um, and also on the tax department. And the first step to do that is really to determine a clear P policy. Um, if you have that in place, it's when you have a new transaction, it's easy to know what to do and you can just have a couple of steps and you already know which approach you're going to take. So this will definitely limit your time per transaction. And it's also easy to explain afterwards. You will know what, what you have done and you can also use it in your master file, local file documentation. A second step is then to automate the process you need to do on a transaction per transaction basis. So especially the rating and pricing um, process should be uh, automated to the furthest extent possible. Also um, the documentation of that. Um, and so this is really something that um, Senders at the moment is already quite strong at. So we have a transfer pricing solution that um, makes a standalone credit rating, takes into account implicit support and determines pricing for loans and, and guarantees. Um, we have quite positive feedback on that uh, from clients. So we would of course also be very happy to show this um, to you. Uh, and on top of that, we're now also automating cash pools and in-house banks. Um, and this solution will actually go live in September. And this is a co-development initiative that we are taking on with a number of large co uh, corporates. And that you of course are also always, um, it's an open invitation. So you would also always be very welcome to participate in. Uh, and you can find both Casimir and my contact details um, also on the screen. Uh, I think we have two minutes left, so it's a bit tight, uh, yeah. but uh, I guess we can also still go to the Q&A session um, if there are any questions. Yeah, there are. Uh, there was one and I see that uh, there are two new ones came in. Um, on the first question on how do negative interest rates impact pooling logic, it's true. Some corporates apply a floor for their uh, cash pool rates and some don't. Yeah, so if you don't apply a floor, then there might be a situation where, whereby some subsidiaries or some cash pool participants uh, might be worse off as they, as they would get a floored rate if, should they have a standalone um, account with the bank instead of their pooled account. In that case, it's not really a problem from a transfer pricing point of view because the OECD also states that there are non-financial advantages of participating in a cash pool. And for example, the, the sweeping is done automatically and so forth. So it can be the case in exceptional uh, market conditions such as negative interest rates that they are worse off in the pool as long as that's not a, um, a standard for all participants. I see also a uh, second question, how well equipped are TMS systems to help treasurers to comply with OECD TP guidelines? 
we see in the market that you need to enter an interest rate on a facility um, and as, as such it's good to to link it with a more specialized system um, for example our, our own uh, transfer pricing uh, solution but the tp compliance is not put uh, into the tms itself i think uh, it's about time so i think i would like to uh, on behalf of myself and melanie thank everyone uh, that participated in this se session i also see that there's one unanswered question so we'll follow up on that after this session and uh, we wish you a very nice day thank you